Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, let me start by thanking you officially for joining us uh, today. I think you probably see a lot of familiar faces out there, most friendly, most of them. Um, uh, and I would also note that you're getting here a little late. Congressman Paul Ryan is coming later. He's going to get here a little early. So if you guys overlap a little bit, maybe we can just get some problems solved right here. What do you Let's think? do it. Let's do it. It's your chance. Um, uh, we have talked amongst ourselves. I've tried to sort of take the, the sense of the room, and so I'm going to try to reflect some of the conversations that have been going on here in the questions I'm going to ask you. You'll not be stunned that I, I'm going to ask you about health care first. Right. Um, you indicated there, and you've indicated publicly quite clearly, that the rollout has been difficult. What do you think you've learned from this experience about the government's ability to do this sort of thing, about the law itself, or about your own administration? Well, uh, there are a couple of things. Number one is that this has been a big problem for a very long time, and so it was always going to be challenging not just to pass a law, but also to implement it. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why, uh, despite a century of talking about it, nobody had been able to successfully try to deal with some of the underlying problems uh, in, uh, in the healthcare system. Uh, the good news is that many of the elements of the Affordable Care Act are already in place and are working exactly the way they're supposed to. So making sure that consumers who have uh, you know, employer-based health insurance are getting a better deal uh, and that are protected uh, from some of the fine print that left them in the lurch when they actually got sick, that's in place. Making sure that young people uh, under the age of 26 can stay on their parents' plan, that's helped three million children already that's making a difference. Uh, helping seniors to get better prescription drug prices, that's already helped millions of seniors and, and billions of dollars in savings. Uh, rebates for people who uh, see insurance companies who are not spending enough on uh, actual care, more on administrative costs or, or, or uh, profits, uh, they're getting rebates. They may not know it's the Affordable Care Act that's given them rebates, but it's happening. So, there were a number of things that uh, uh, were already in place over the last three years that uh, got implemented effectively. The other thing that hasn't been talked about a lot is cost. Um, there was a lot of skepticism when we passed the Affordable Care Act that we were going to be given a lot of people care, but we weren't doing anything about the underlying costs. And in fact, over the last three years, we have seen health care costs grow at the slowest pace in 50 years and that affects the bottom lines of everybody here. Uh, and there are a lot of smart delivery system reforms that slowly across the system are being implemented and uh, they're making a big difference and that's saving us money. That's why, by the way, uh, some of the projections that uh, in terms of what the Affordable Care Act would do to deficits have actually proved uh, even better than we had originally expected. What I have learned though with respect to setting up these marketplaces, which are essentially uh, mechanisms where uh, people who are currently in the individual market or uh, don't have health insurance at all um, can join together, shop, uh, and uh, insurance companies will compete for their business. Uh, setting those things up uh, is very challenging just mechanically. The good news is that choice and competition has actually worked and insurers came in with bids that were even lower than people expected, about 16% lower than had originally been projected. Uh, the challenge has been just making sure that consumers are actually able to get on a website, see those choices and shop. And I think that we probably underestimated the complexities of building out a website that needed to work the way it should. There is a larger problem that I probably uh, speak personally, but also as the administration, could have identified earlier. And that is uh, the way the federal government does procurement and does IT uh, is just generally not very efficient. Uh, in fact, uh, there's probably no bigger gap between the private sector and the public sector than IT. Uh, and we've seen that in, for example, uh, the VA and the Department of Defense trying to deal with electronic medical records for our servicemen as they move into uh, civilian life. Most of that stuff's still done on paper. We've spent billions of dollars. I'm not saying we as in my administration. I mean, 
we've now had about a decade of experimentation, spent billions of dollars, and it's still not working the way it should. So uh, what we probably needed to do on the front end was to blow up how we procure for IT, Be especially on a system this complicated. We did not do that successfully. Uh, now, we are getting it fixed, but it would have been better to do it on the front end rather than the back end. And the last point I'll make uh, is that um, you know, in terms of expectation setting, yeah. um, there's no doubt that in an environment in which we had to fight tooth and nail to get this passed, it ended up being passed on a, bi uh, on a partisan basis, not for lack of trying, because I met with an awful lot of Republicans to try to get them uh, to go along, but because there was just ideological resistance to the idea of, of dealing with the uninsured and people with pre-existing conditions. Yeah, there was, a, there was a price to that. Uh, and it was that uh, what was already going to be hard uh, was operating within a very difficult political environment. Uh, and we should have anticipated that that would create a rockier rollout than if Democrats and Republicans were both invested in success. One of the problems we've had is uh, one side of uh, Capitol Hill is invested in failure, and, and that makes uh, I think the, the kind of iterative process of fixing glitches as they come up and fine-tuning the law uh, more challenging. But I'm optimistic that we can get it fixed. Well, that's the question I was going to ask next. Is it possible you've lost enough time here and enough potential customers in the exchanges that you're not going to reach the critical mass of sign-ups that you need to make the marketplace work? Is that a danger that you have to worry about right now? Well, it's, it's something that we have to pay attention to. But uh, keep in mind that this model of marketplaces uh, was based on what was done in Massachusetts. And the experience in Massachusetts was that uh, in the first month, 153 or 63 people signed up out of an ultimate 36,000. Uh, it, it was less than 1% signed up in that first month, partly because buying insurance uh, is a complicated process for a lot of people. When they have more choices, it means that they're going to take more time. Um, there's no doubt that we've lost some time, but uh, the website's getting better each week. By the end of this month, it will be functioning for the majority of people who are using it. They'll be able to shop, see what their choices are. The prices are good. The prices are not changing uh, for, during the open enrollment period that goes out until March. And so I think that we're going to have time to catch up. What's also been expressed as a concern is the mix of people that sign up. So we might end up uh, you know, having millions of people sign up. They're happy with their new coverage. But we've got more people who are older, uh, more likely to get sick than younger right. and healthier. We've got to monitor that carefully. We always anticipated, though, that younger folks would be the last folks in, uh, just because you know, it's been a while since you and I were young, but uh, as I recall, uh, you don't think that you're going to get sick uh, uh, you know, at, at, at that time. So um, look, uh, I am confident that uh, the model that we've built, which works off of the existing private insurance system, uh, is one that will succeed. Uh, we are going to have to, A, fix the website so everybody feels confident about that. We're going to have to obviously remarket and rebrand, uh, and that will be challenging in this political environment. But keep in mind, in, in the first month, we also had 12 million people visit the site. Yeah. The demand is there. There are 41 million people who have health, uh, don't have health insurance. The folks in the individual market, uh, many of them are going to get a much better deal in the marketplaces. And so uh, we've just got to keep on uh, improving the customer experience and make sure that uh, we're fending off efforts not to fix the problem because if somebody wants to help us fix it, I'm all game, but fending off efforts to uh, completely undermine it. Let me turn to the economy, the broader economy, probably the, the predominant concern of people in this room. Um, we seem to be stuck in an economic growth pattern of okay but not great growth. Your friend Larry Summers was here earlier today and said essentially the problem or one of the problems is that the system can't do two things at once. It can't cut deficits and spur growth. It needs to do one or the other right now. 
it needs to spur growth, should not worry so much about deficits. Do you agree? And if you do agree, how do you make that happen? You know, actually, Larry and I uh, and most of my economic team, in fact, all my economic team have uh, consistently maintained that there is a way to reconcile the concerns about debt and deficits with the concerns about growth. What we know is, is that our, uh, our fiscal problems are not short-term deficits. Our discretionary budget, that portion of the federal budget that isn't uh, defense or uh, Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid, the entitlement programs, is at its smallest level in my lifetime, probably since Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, we are not lavishly spending on a whole bunch of social programs out there. Uh, and in many ways, uh, a lot of these programs have become more efficient and uh, pretty effective. Defense, we spent a lot from 2001 uh, to 2011, but generally we are stabilizing. And the Pentagon, working with me, uh, have come up with plans that allow us to meet our security needs uh, while still bringing down some of the costs of, uh, of defense, particularly after having ended the war in Iraq and on the brink of ending the war in Afghanistan. So when we talk about our, our deficit and debt problems, it is almost entirely health care costs. You, you, you eliminate the, the, the delta, the, the difference between what we spend on health care and what every other country, uh, advanced industrialized nation spends on health care, and that's our long-term debt. And if we're able to bend the cost curve, we help solve the problem. Now, uh, one way to do that is just to make health care cheaper overall. That's, I think, the best way to do it, and that's what we've been doing through some of the measures in the Affordable Care Act. There are some other provisions that we could take that would maintain uh, our commitment to seniors, uh, Medicare, Social Security, the disabled, and Medicaid, while still reducing very modestly the, the cost of those programs. If we do those things, that solves our real fiscal problem, and we could take some of that money, a very modest portion on the front end, and invest in infrastructure that puts people back to work. It, uh, improve uh, our research and development. So uh, the idea would be do some things in the short term that focus on growth, do some things in the long term that deal with the long term debt. That's what my budget reflects. That's what a, a multiple series of negotiations with John Boehner uh, uh, you know, talked about, the so-called grand bargain. We couldn't quite get there in the end, mainly because uh, uh, Republicans had a great deal of difficulty with the idea of putting in more revenue uh, to balance out some of the changes that were made on entitlements. I would guess a lot of people in this room would say that another way to make some of those things happen would be to fix the corporate tax code, that everybody agrees is a mess. You've got some companies that pay way too much compared to their international competitors. Some companies don't pay at all. It's not a good system. It's not an efficient system. Everybody agrees, but it doesn't ever seem to change. Can you make a change? And and can you do something about repatriation of, of U.S. Uh, uh, assets overseas? Well, here's the good news, is that uh, both my administration and Republicans have talked about corporate tax reform. And uh, Paul Ryan, who's going to be uh, uh, coming after me, has said he's interested in corporate tax reform. Uh, and we've reached out to him, and we've said, let's get to work. We put forward a very specific set of proposals that would lower the corporate tax rate, broaden the base, close some loopholes. And in terms of uh, international uh, companies and competitiveness, what we've said is rather than a whole bunch of uh, tangled laws that incentivize folks to keep money overseas, let's have a uh, modest uh, but clear global minimum tax get rid of some of the, the huge fluctuations that people experience. It will save companies money, make them more competitive, and uh, in terms of transitioning to that system, actually allow some people to bring back money and in a one-time way uh, help us finance uh, infrastructure and some other projects that need to get done. 
Uh, I don't expect Republicans to adopt exactly the proposal that uh, we've put forward, but there's not that much separation between what uh, Democrats are talking about. I know uh, Chairman Max Balk has put out something today, Chairman of the Finance Committee, what Dave Camp uh, over in the House has talked about. This should be bridgeable. The one thing I would caution uh, is, and I've said this to the Business Roundtable and uh, other corporate leaders who I've talked to, uh, people like the idea of corporate tax reform in theory. Uh, in practice, if you want to make uh, the corporate tax reform deficit neutral, right. then you actually have to close some loopholes. And people like the idea of a simpler tax system until it's their particular loophole that's about to be, get closed. Uh, and what we can't afford to do is to keep all the loopholes that are currently in place and lower the corporate tax rate, we would then blow another hole of the deficit that would have to be filled. And uh, what I'm not willing to do is to have uh, higher rates on the middle class uh, in order to pay for that. Some of the CEOs here had a working group earlier today, uh, the, the, the mission of which was to address the question of how do you stay competitive. <laughs> Interestingly, at least to me, their first priority, first priority was this, immigration reform. The U.S. needs immigration reform to retain talented workers educated in the U.S. and attract talent to the U.S. Immigration reform could provide an instant jolt to the U.S. economy, which we need. I know you agree with that statement, but it's hard to see that happening right now. You've got the Senate off on one track, it's passed a comprehensive bill, the House won't even agree to take up. Democrats want to do comprehensive reform, Republicans want to do step-by-step -step reform. It's a poisonous political atmosphere. Can you make it happen? Yeah, uh, I am actually optimistic that we're going to get this done. Um, I'm a, but I, I am a congenital optimist. I, I would have to be. I, I'm named Barack Obama, I ran for president. So <laughs> the, uh, and, and won. And, and won twice. Uh, so, look, uh, keep in mind, first of all, that uh, what the CEOs here said is absolutely right. Uh, this is a boost to our economy. Uh, everywhere I go, I meet with entrepreneurs and CEOs who say, I've got you know, these terrific folks. They just graduated from Caltech or MIT or Stanford. They're ready to do business here. Some of them have uh, these amazing uh, uh, new ideas that we think we can commercialize, but uh, they're being uh, dragged back to their home countries, not because they want to go, but because the immigration system doesn't work. The, the good news is that the Senate bill was a bipartisan bill, and we know what the component parts of this are. We've got to have strong border security. We've got to have better enforcement of existing laws. We've got to make sure that uh, we have a legal immigration system that doesn't cause people to uh, sit in the queue for five years, 10 years, 15 years in some cases, 20 years. Uh, we should want to immediately say to young people who we've helped to educate in this country, you want to stay? Uh, we want you here. Uh, and we do have to deal with about 11 million folks who are in this country, most of them just seeking opportunity, they did break the law by coming here or overstaying their visa. Uh, and they've got to earn their way uh, out of the shadows, pay a fine, learn English, get to the back of the line, pay their back taxes, uh, but giving them a mechanism whereby they can uh, get right by, uh, by our society. And that's reflected in the Senate bill. Now, uh, I actually think that there are a number of House Republicans, including Paul Ryan, I think if you ask him about it, who agree with that. They're suspicious of comprehensive bills, but you know what, if they want to chop that thing up into five pieces, uh, as long as all five pieces get done, uh, I don't care what it looks like as long as it's actually delivering on those core values that we talk about. Um, Democrats have been pretty suspicious that all five pieces were well, and, done. And, and, and that's the problem. I mean, the key is, you know, what we don't want to do is simply carve out one piece of it, let's say agricultural jobs, which are important, but is easier, frankly, uh, or the high-skill jobs that many of the, in your audience here would immediately want to do, but leave behind some of the tougher stuff 
uh, that still needs to get done. We, we're not going to have a situation in which 11 million people uh, are still living in the shadows and potentially uh, getting deported uh, on an ongoing basis. So we're going to have to do it all. Uh, in my conversations with the Republicans, I actually think the divide is not that wide. So what we just have to do is find a pathway where uh, Republicans in the House in particular feel comfortable enough about process that they can go ahead and m meet us. Uh, this, by the way, Jerry, I think is a good example of something that's been striking me about our, our politics for a while. Uh, when you go to other countries, uh, the political divisions are so much more stark and wider. Here in America, the difference between Democrats and Republicans, I, we're fighting inside the 40-yard line. Maybe... It, you fooled most people may, on that in the last few months, I'd say. But. No, no, but, but, well, no, 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 the, the uh, I, I, I would distinguish between the, the rhetoric and the tactics yeah. versus the ideological differences. I mean, in most countries, you've got, you know, people call me a socialist sometimes, but no, you, you've got to meet real socialists. <laughs> you'll, you'll have a sense of what a, what a socialist is. Um, you know, the, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about lowering the corporate tax rate. My health care reform is based on the, 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 the private marketplace. Uh, stock market's looking pretty good last time I checked. Uh, and, you know, it is true that I'm concerned about uh, growing inequality in our system. Uh, but nobody questions uh, the efficacy of uh, uh, market economies in terms of producing wealth and, and uh, innovation uh, and keeping us competitive. Uh, on the flip side, you know, most Republicans, even, even the Tea Party, one of my favorite signs during uh, the campaign was uh, uh, folks hoisting a sign, governments, keep, keep, keep your hands off my Medicare. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, you know, ideologically, they did not like the idea of the federal government, yeah. and yet they felt very protective about the basic social safety net that had been uh, structured. So uh, my, my simple point is this. If we can get beyond um, the tactical advantages that parties perceive in painting folks as extreme and... Uh, uh, trying to keep an eye always on the next election. And for a while at least, just focus on governing, then the, there is probably 70% overlap uh, on a whole range of issues. A lot of Republicans want to get infrastructure done, just like I do. A lot of them believe in basic research, just like I do. A lot of them want to reform entitlements uh, to make sure that they're affordable for the next generation. So do I. A lot of them say they want to reform our tax system. So do I. There are going to be differences on the details. Uh, and those details matter. And I'll fight very hard for them. But uh, we shouldn't uh, think that somehow uh, the reason we've got these problems is because uh, uh, our policy differences are so great. Well, the details were obviously important enough to shut down the government just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and everybody knows we're headed back toward showdowns again, January budget, February right. debt ceiling. Um, Jack Lew was here earlier, your Treasury Secretary, and said he thought maybe the system crossed the threshold in October and, and has realized it doesn't want to go back and do that again. Are you confident it's not going to go back and do that again? And by the way, the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, suggested today that the U.S. just get rid of the debt ceiling entirely. Would you be in favor of that? Uh, I think that the way our system is set up is like a loaded gun. Uh, and once uh, people thought we can get leverage on policy disputes by threatening default, uh, that was an extraordinarily dangerous precedent. Uh, and that's a principle that I had to adhere to, not just for me, but for the next president, that you're not going to be able to threaten the entire US or world economy simply because you disagree with me about a health care bill. Um, I'd, I'd like to believe that uh, the Republicans recognized that was not a good strategy. Uh, and uh, we're probably better off with a system in which 
uh, that threat is not there on a perpetual basis. I do not foresee uh, what we saw in October uh, being repeated in January. Uh, but you know, the, the, the broader point is one that I think all of us have to uh, take to heart. We have to be able to disagree on policy issues without resorting to the kinds of extreme tactics that end up uh, hurting all of us. And that's been my main disagreement uh, with uh, a lot of my uh, Republican friends. And, and frankly, the American people agree with that. Uh, that they don't expect us to uh, march in lockstep. There's a reason why we got two parties in this country. They do expect that we are constantly thinking about how are we making sure they can find a job that pays well, that their kids can go to college and afford it, that uh, we are uh, growing and competitive, uh, that uh, you know, we are dealing with our fiscal um, position in a sensible way. And, and if we keep them in mind consistently, uh, then I think we're going to be successful. I, you know, one, one thing that you've got some international CEOs here, and I think they'll confirm this. When I travel, what's striking to me is people around the world think we've got a really good hand. You just take the example of energy, they say, uh, America is poised to change our geopolitics entirely because of the advances we've made in oil production, natural gas production. It means manufacturing here is much more attractive than it used to be. Uh, that's a huge competitive advantage. We, we've got uh, uh, the most productive workers just about uh, in the world. And we, our workers have become more and more productive. And a lot of companies look at that and say, uh, we wish we had uh, workers who uh, were able to, to uh, uh, operate uh, the way these folks do. Our university systems, our research uh, mech uh, uh, you know, sure. all those things are the envy of the world. And one of the great things about America is sometimes uh, we uh, get worried that we're losing traction and the sky is falling. and. Back in the 80s, Japan was about to take over, and then China, and obviously before that, uh, the Soviet Union. And we usually come out okay uh, because we change and we adapt. I just want everybody to, to remember that um, we're in a very strong position to compete as long as our political system functions. It doesn't have to be outstanding. This is sort of like Winston Churchill, two cheers for democracy. And you know, uh, it, it does, it's always going to be messy but it's got to function better than it has. I'm in the red zone on the clock here, but let me, I did want to ask about a, a question about international affairs. You mentioned the yeah. world and the, and, and, and the U.S. position in it. Um, there's the possibility this week uh, of an agreement with Iran, a, a, a preliminary limited agreement in which they would freeze some of their nuclear activities in return for some relief on sanctions. Your Israeli friends have been arguing, along with some, uh, some, of, your, uh, of, some of your friends as well as your uh, foes in Congress, that if you give the Iranian regime any relief on sanctions, the sanctions regime will fall apart. Countries that don't want to be there in the first place will head for the exits. It'll all come apart, and that's the danger of what you're negotiating right now. I know you talked to some senators about this very topic today. Uh, is there going to be a deal, and why can you ease sanctions without having them fall apart? Well, uh, just by way of background, when I came into office, uh, we had a trade embargo. The U.S. had done some things unilaterally. We did not have a strong, enforceable international mechanism to really put the squeeze on Iran around its nuclear program, despite the fact that it violated a range of UN uh, and uh, non-proliferation treaty uh, requirements. So we built, we constructed, with the help of Congress, the strongest uh, sanctions regime ever. And it has put a bite on the Iranian economy. They have seen a 5% contraction last year in their uh, economy. It's projected to be con another contraction this year. And in part because the sanctions have been so effective, uh, we were able to get Iran to seriously come to the table and look at how are they going to give assurances to the international community that they are, in fact, not pursuing a nuclear weapons program. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to close a deal this week. Uh, or next week. We have been very firm with the Iranians, even on the interim deal, about what we expect. And you know, some of the reporting out there has been 
uh, somewhat inaccurate, uh, understandably because the P5 plus one, uh, the members of the uh, permanent members of the Security Council, in addition to and, and Germany as well, have kept uh, the negotiations fairly uh, tight. But the essence of the deal would be that they would halt advances on their nuclear program. They would roll back some elements that get them closer to what we call breakout capacity, where they can run for a weapon before the international community has a chance to react. That they would subject themselves to more vigorous inspections, even than the ones that are currently there, in some cases daily inspections. In return, what we would do would be to open up the spigot a little bit for a very modest amount of relief that is entirely uh, subject to uh, reinstatement if, in fact, they violated any part of this early agreement. And it would purchase a period of time, let's say six months, during which uh, we could see if they could get to the end state of a, uh, a position where we, the Israelis, the international community could say with confidence Iran's not pursuing a nuclear weapon. Um, now, part of the reason I have confidence that the sanctions don't fall apart is because we're not doing anything around the most powerful sanctions. The oil sanctions, the banking sanctions, the financial services sanctions, uh, those are the ones that have really taken a big chunk out of the Iranian economy. So uh, oil production and oil sales out of Iran have dropped by more than half since these sanctions were put in place. They've got over a hundred billion dollars of oil revenue that is sitting outside of their country. The rial, their uh, currency, has dropped precipitously. And all those sanctions and the architecture for them don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Essentially what we do is we allow them to access a small portion of these assets that are frozen. Keep in mind though that because the oil and banking sanctions stay in place, they will actually still be losing money even during this six month period relative to the amount of oil sales they had back in 2011. So what we are, what we are suggesting both to the Israelis, to members of Congress here, to the international community, but also to the Iranians is, let's look, let's test the proposition that over the next six months we can resolve this in a uh, diplomatic fashion uh, while uh, maintaining the essential sanctions architecture and uh, as President of the United States, me maintaining all options to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. Uh, I think that is a, a, a test that is worth conducting. And uh, my hope and expectation is not that we're going to solve all of this just uh, this week in an, this interim phase, but rather that we're purchasing ourselves some time to see how serious the Iranian regime might uh, be in re-entering uh, membership in, uh, in the world community and uh, taking uh, the, the yoke of these sanctions off, uh, off the backs of their economy. Um, well, Mr. President, with that, let me just thank you again for joining us. I appreciate it very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.